We now know how to make effective crime maps. For example, like this density map of thefts of mo motor vehicles in Nashville in Tennessee. Now this is a good map, but it's missing lots of contextual information that would be useful for readers. So we can use an acronym to remember which elements we can consider adding to a map called dog tails. Date, orientation, grid, scale, title, author, index, legend, and sources. We don't necessarily have to include all of these elements on every map we make, but we do need to think whether they might be useful. And this is one of the design considerations that we need to make whenever we're making a map. First thing that we're going to discuss is the map title. And we're going to discuss it first because it's probably the most important uh, piece of supporting information. It's quite high in the visual hierarchy, probably second after the, the data itself. And that's why I've positioned it at the top of the map. I've isolated it rather than having it superimposed on the, on the map itself where it might become less visually prominent because it's surrounded by other things. Um, the text is quite large, certainly larger than the text used on the map itself. And this is because the title is likely to be the first thing that readers look at or the second thing after the map data. There's three types of map title. The first is just a descriptive title saying what the map shows. So in this case, theft of motor vehicles or theft of motor vehicles in Nashville 2019. But because this is one of the most important elements on the map and because it's the first or second thing that readers are likely to look at, we can probably make better use of this visual real estate than a simple descriptive title like this. Now we could use an interrogative title, uh, where, where do cars get stolen, to ask a question. And that might be appropriate if we were, for example, running a website that depended on clicks and so we wanted to, to drive as many people to, to our map as possible. But that's not what we're doing generally in crime mapping. And so it's much better to answer the question in the title than it is to ask the question, but not answer it. So, so we can do this by putting the main finding from our map, the main thing that we want the reader to take away in the title. So in this case, motor vehicle theft is concentrated downtown because whoever the readers of our map are, for all of those users, we want them to know that motor vehicle theft is concentrated downtown. We can also at this point add a subtitle um, saying theft of motor vehicles recorded by Metro Nashville PD 2019 to give some more of that descriptive information, but we're making that less visually prominent. The next thing that we can add is a legend. Um, and what it does is it shows the density values in each uh, band, each colored band shown on the map. Legends are really important for showing how we, to interpret the data that we have put on our map. But we don't necessarily need to include every map layer. I haven't even included on the legend that the outlines of the precincts are also included on the map because it's obvious from the labels that are on the map. And we don't want to over clutter the map with information that doesn't need to be there. Now, one of the manual changes that I'm going to make to the legend here is that I'm going to take away the density values because kernel density values themselves are not very useful uh, as numbers. It's much more important to understand that the density is higher in one place and lower in another place. So I'm going to strip that uh, information, that numerical information away and just say darker areas show higher densities of thefts lighter areas show lower densities of theft. Again, minimizing the distraction, keeping the focus on the data. Next thing I'm going to add, much lower down the visual hierarchy, at the bottom of the map, right aligned, much smaller text, gray text, a lighter gray text than the title, is some information about who's written the map and the date on which it was produced. Now the map author is important because just like knowing who the author is of a textbook or a report, 
it's useful to know who produced a map so that you can assess how reliable it's likely to be. The date is useful, again, because it helps people understand, well, how up to date is this map? The next thing we can show on our map is a scale. Now, scales come in at least three types. The first shows how many units on the ground, say two kilometers, corresponds to however many units on the map, say one centimeter. So two kilometers to one centimeter might be a map scale. Now this might have been once a useful way of presenting map scales, but it stopped being useful at the very latest when somebody invented a photocopier that meant that your map could be reproduced at different sizes. And so that two kilometer to one centimeter relationship might not be true anymore. Now that maps are most often viewed on screens or maybe printed out on printers that can print them at any size, this type of, of scale is not useful at all um, and should almost certainly be avoided. The second type of scale is this, 1 to 25,000 uh, as a ratio scale. And what this says is whatever unit on the page is 25,000 times smaller than that actual space on the ground. So one centimetre on the page equals 25,000 centimetres on the on the earth. Now this is accurate but not very intuitive. So again we try to avoid uh, this type of scale. Much more useful is a scale that shows the units on the map itself. So is a scale bar like this um, or as a series of ticks um, against a line. Either way that's much more useful for showing scale. So that's the type that we're going to add to our map in the bottom left hand corner here. Now the scale is quite small, uh, it's in fairly light grey lines and text, so quite low down the visual hierarchy. And that's because most people looking at this map don't need to know the scale because they probably already know Nashville if they're looking at a map of motor vehicle theft in Nashville. Uh, and so they intuitively understand roughly how far the distances are on this map. But if they do need to measure a distance, it's there. But it's very low down the visual hierarchy because like the author information, most people won't need it. Next thing we could add is a north arrow. Now north arrows come in all sorts of different shapes, some of which are only suitable for things like pirate treasure maps because they're extremely uh, elaborate. Some designs of north arrow don't even necessarily show north. Um, which is unhelpful, but they're typically included in map software. But much like the scale, we want to, the north arrow, if it's present at all, to be very far down the, the visual hierarchy. So we want the simplest possible north arrow, we want to keep it small, we want to keep it out of the way. So I've put it in the bottom right hand corner of our map. You don't always need a north arrow because often people will know which way is north on a map or they won't need to know which way is north on a map uh, because they're not going to use it for example for, for navigation or for comparing two places. So I would actually probably leave the north arrow off this map. I've just included it here so that we can talk about it. The next thing that we could add to our map is a grid. Now grids might be useful for two things. One is for uh, locating particular points with reference to a grid. So if we wanted to be able to work out where a, um, a particular location was and write down its latitude and longitude, as we might need to do, for example, on a walking map, then we might want to include a grid. And so if you look at most maps that are used by hikers, they will have a grid on them. We don't need to do that. The second thing that grids can be useful for is showing distance. If the grid uh, squares, for example, are all one kilometre in size, as they are on lots of walking maps, outdoor adventure maps, that sort of thing. But again, we don't need to do that here. If people do need to look at distance, they can look at the scale because the map isn't that large. So it's easy to, to just look down at the scale in the bottom left hand corner. So I'm going to remove that. Final thing you might want to include, and you might not want to, this is a stylistic decision, is what's called a neat line. A black line or any sort of line around the edge of the map just to make it clear the, the, the boundaries that you're, that you're showing. This is uh, 
something that some people recommend, but it's not a requirement. So if we look at the two maps, so before we've added all this contextual information and after, we can see that the after map is probably more useful because it's got that contextual information on it, but that does distract somewhat from the data. And so knowing that that's going to happen, knowing that's an inevitable consequence of adding this context, we need to make sure that we reinforce this visual hierarchy, that the data, by being brightly colored, by being in the center of the map, by taking up most of the space, is always the thing that people are going to be focused on most.